that the number one pick in the 2021 NBA draft goes to the Detroit Pistons. Who's got the number one pick in this year's draft? Who's got the number one pick in this year's draft? Basketball! Select Isaiah Stewart. The Detroit Pistons select Killian Hayes. Sadiq, that was absolutely sensational. I don't know what went into that process. I met the criteria to be selected, but I wasn't. From long range. Oh! Yes! 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 Detroit Basketball! Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. I'm your host, Mike Angelone, and joining me tonight on the night of the NBA lottery is Aaron Johnson. Aaron, how are you doing, buddy? I know we, uh, were dealt a tough blow. The NBA ping pong gods were not smiling. No, they were not smiling on the Detroit Pistons whatsoever. Uh, I had a a large notebook starting to come together with notes on Paolo Bencaro and and Holmgren. And that's, uh, it's useless now for anything that I wanted to uh, do with it regarding the Detroit Pistons. So um, the unfortunate realization that Detroit, uh, won't be drafting, you know, in the top three, and that I wasted a fair amount of time, you know, researching these guys with the intent that there would be a chance that uh, the Pistons could draft them come June 23rd. But that is uh, not going to be the case, at least as of now, with uh, the Pistons landing the fifth pick uh, in the NBA draft via the NBA draft lottery. Uh, we've got so much to talk about. We've got so many rapid thoughts just kind of going through ahead. I mean, we're literally recording this. 20 minutes after it ended. So uh, yeah, yeah. I'm ready to get into it. I'm interested to see where this goes because I know there's so many different discussions that can be had. Um, so mm-hmm. excited to get into it. Really wish Jasper uh, was here for this one, but we're going to hold down the fort and we're going to get into so much after a rough night for the future of the Detroit Pistons. Yes, we will get into all of it. But first, I'd like to mention our sponsor for this podcast, and it is Bet Online. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info for all the latest odds, news, and sports developments for the playoffs, for Major League Baseball, fights, and NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all sports wagering needs, including live betting and the fan favorite Vegas casino and poker games. It's really easy to get started. Head on over to the website or use your mobile device to sign up and use our promo code BLEAV. That's B L E A V. Receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Again, that's B-L-E-A-V. Receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. All right, let's get into it. We have one topic and one topic only, and that topic is the NBA lottery. Um, the Pistons were awarded the fifth pick in the draft. It's about a month away on June 23rd. ESPN has mocked Keegan Murray from Iowa to the Pistons at five. Uh, well, hmm. not what we had in mind. Um, the Magic will pick one. Oklahoma City will pick two. The Houston Rockets will pick three. And the Sacramento Kings move up. They will have the fourth pick in the draft. Boy, um, just a quick, re- quick, rapid reaction to Detroit getting dealt a difficult blow with the fifth overall pick. Yeah, uh, not ideal. I mean, obviously Detroit went in and they had just under a fifteen percent chance of getting um, the fifth pick in the draft. Uh, the lowest they could have fallen to was seven. Had you know about a, I believe it was like fourteen percent at one, thirteen point seven percent at two, thirteen point four percent at three. So. Uh, the percentages were all, you know, pretty even one to five. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely unfortunate, uh, you know, on the flip side, obviously you think back to last year where Detroit ended up getting the number one pick. And obviously that led to, to Cade Cunningham, um, which was great, but this year, definitely the, the, the flip side of, of what last year was uh, for the franchise. And it's definitely unfortunate because the, the hope, uh, internally and externally was that this was really the last year that the Pistons would have uh, to worry about being in this position of, you know, really needing to, to get a top pick and, and 
have to have that opportunity of drafting, you know, uh, one of the elite prospects in the draft. This was really uh, what was hoping to be the last go around at that for the foreseeable future, um, you know, with Kate Cunningham and then someone like Paolo Bencaro, Chet Holmgren, or Jabari Smith Jr. to pair with him uh, and really cement Detroit's core uh, going forward. I think landing five uh, makes it a little bit more difficult for Detroit because I think there's a, a real drop off after three, maybe four, depending on uh, your, your belief in Jaden Ivy. I know we're going to talk about uh, him a little bit uh, tonight, but after the, the top four prospects, I think it gets a little bit murkier uh, in terms of the best names available. Uh, is it Keegan Murray, who in ESPN's uh, post uh, draft lottery mock draft was who the Pistons were mocked to take uh, the forward out of Iowa? Uh, is it Ben Matherin out of Arizona? Uh, is it Shaden Sharp, who, you know, reclassified, went to Kentucky, uh, never ended up playing a game with them, still entered uh, the draft. So the last stuff we have from him is uh, from last uh, July when he played um, in one of the Nike events, Nike Peach Jam uh, in 2021, uh, July of 2021. So that's the last we've seen of him. And then you have like his high school AAU basketball film. But how much of that is relevant, you know? a year and a half, two years later. Um, so it's not good. Uh, in short, it's not good. It's a lot dif- more difficult uh, to, to find a guy that you that really can be one of the guys uh, at five rather than one, two, or three. Um, but Troy Weaver and, and the, 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 the front office and the scouting department, obviously they've prepared for all these situations. And you know now it, it gets to this next month uh, with the draft coming on June 23rd. So you know, you're just a little o- over a month away this next month where you get into uh, really scouting these guys, you get into the pre-draft workouts, the interviews. Uh, it's going to be a very important uh, draft for Detroit, whether they got a top three pick or not. Uh, I think it gets a little bit difficult, more difficult now that they're looking at the fifth pick rather than two, three, four. So we've our group chat's been bouncing around a lot as, as to what they could do, what they, they being the Pistons, what the Pistons could do <clears throat> to secure a higher pick. To me, it just seems like based on the teams that are directly in front of Detroit, the only one that I think would be looking for um, maybe moving out of four, and getting a, a, you know an NBA ready player right now would be Sacramento, but it seems like if the Pistons were to move out of five, if you know if they say we don't like anybody, we can't find anybody that's a decent fit at five that also couldn't be available at seven, a six, seven, or eight. It seems like to me that they have a better chance of moving back and still being able to get somebody in their range that they're interested in. Do you feel that same way? Yeah, 100%. I don't think any of the top three are looking to move out of the top three. Yeah, I think you're right with Sacramento maybe being willing to at four, but uh, does that do anything for Detroit, you know, moving one pick up? Uh, and Sacramento's got an in- interesting roster right now. So they they obviously traded Tyrese Halliburton, uh, one of their guards. They traded him at the trade deadline this season uh, to get Sabonis, bring in a big that they're going to build around. Uh, with the Aaron Fox and, and they drafted Davion Mitchell last year. So they have their two guards and they have a big to work with outside of that. And, and Harrison Barnes, that's a pretty fluid situation there. Uh, I don't think they have a clear cut guy at four. I don't think it's going to be Jaden Ivy just thinking off the rip. I mean, obviously they like uh, and trusted Davion Mitchell enough to trade away Tyrese Halliburton, who by all means was really a promising prospect for them uh, so that they could get some bonus. So I'm not sure they're necessarily looking to get a guard, uh, but you look at who's available at four and assuming Ivy doesn't jump into the top three unexpectedly, uh, you know, you're looking at a group of Jaden Ivy, Shaden Sharp, Keegan Murray, Ben Matherin, it's three guards and then Murray, who's, you know, four. Uh, and I don't know if any of those guys are really a, a great fit for Sacramento. I think maybe Murray would be the best in terms of fit, but I, I certainly don't think he's the most talented. 
uh, out of that group. So they're in an interesting spot because uh, they don't necessarily need a guard, but at four, the best prospect that's projected to be available is a guard. Uh, but again, I don't think it really makes sense for Detroit to try to move up one spot when Sacramento, you know, I don't know what they're going to do, but I just don't think it would make sense for them if they took someone like Jaden Ivey. Uh, but Detroit on the flip side, they could be looking just to trade out of, of the spot in general. I think we saw some stuff uh, that was reported maybe a week or two ago um, that if Detroit what didn't land a top pick, that they were going to be aggressive with trying to trade the pick because, uh, they liked, you know, obviously they liked uh, Jabari Smith Jr. They had been linked to him. Um, there's been the talk about Paulo, obviously Chet, but there was a report also that came out, and I apologize for not having who it came from, but there was uh, a verified report that was essentially saying, look, if Detroit doesn't land uh, one of the top picks, they will get a little bit more aggressive in trying to trade out. And heck, we knew we know that's a uh, a thing that Troy Weaver's not afraid to do. Obviously, he's moved to draft picks before. There was a lot of talk about him doing it potentially last year with the number one pick. Um, so it wouldn't actually surprise me. I think that that's an interesting scenario. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what type of package makes sense. I don't know if there's a, a team that wants five and is willing to give up a, a, a legitimate name right away. I, I'm trying to think of maybe a, a fringe playoff team or something that maybe is looking to get younger, start a rebuild, whatever, but it just doesn't, nothing really comes to my head right now. Maybe there's a world where the pick gets packaged with Jeremy Grant. Um, but I think that uh, then this might be something where we get into a little bit more later, but I think the Pistons ending up at five actually makes it a lot easier to just hold on to Jeremy Grant because you're not drafting his potential replacement now uh, at one, two or three with, you know, Jabari Chet and Paolo. Um, but I could definitely see Detroit trading out or trading back uh, in some way, shape, or form. We haven't heard them really attached to any of these guys. Um, outside of Keegan Murray, there was a report, I believe, that uh, the Pistons did like Keegan Murray. Obviously, he's been mocked to them by by ESPN, and obviously they know they have intel that others don't um, on guys who are on teams that like certain players and whatnot. So there could be uh, some reasoning behind him being mocked there uh, already after the lottery. Um, but it's it's definitely something that I could see happening. You know, I don't know if what percentage I, I'd market at, but I think, you know, there's ju there's just as good of a chance that Detroit trades away the pick or trades back uh, with the pick rather than selecting a guy. I don't think it's a clear cut. We know the Pistons will draft at five. Heck, they weren't. We didn't know for sure that we were going to draft at one last year There was with all that uh, trade talk okay. that they'd move one. Right. You know, in looking – at the rest of the draft. So after the Pistons, Indiana picks six, the Blazers pick seventh. The Pelicans get the eighth pick as a, <clears throat> as a byproduct of the Anthony Davis trade. That would have been the Lakers pick. Spurs will pick ninth, Washington picks 10th. The New York Knicks pick 11. The Thunder also have the 12th pick in the draft. The Hornets are 13th and the Cavaliers pick 14th. So, I mean, I think I think if they were to dangle Jeremy Grant and were trying to get another lottery pick to potentially entice Sacramento or some other team, like I'm in total, total agreement. I don't think those top three teams are moving out of, out of three. This is a very top three heavy draft. And then it starts to get a little bit wonky after that. There's a lot of players that are going to get picked based on their fit with the team. And you're right. The Kings don't need Jaden Ivey. He does not quite fit um, with what they currently have. Although nothing has really ever seemingly fit with the Sacramento Kings and that hasn't stopped them before. So that's, they're like the wild card team that you don't really know what they're going to do. They, they could pick not Jaden Ivey and then the Pistons, you know, choices get a lot easier. Um, you know, they're probably going to take Jay Nivey at five. So I think in those teams that I just mentioned, picks six through 14, I think there are teams that would be interested in Jeremy Grant um, that are looking to win. You know, I mean, Charlotte may be interested at 13. I think that's probably more earmarked for a center in a potential trade. Um, the Knicks are a wild card. They, they had a very disappointing season last year. You know, they could be trying to, get a player like Jeremy Grant to infuse themselves with, with talent right now. Um, the Wizards as well. They did 
didn't have Bradley Beal for a lot of last year. They made a big move and got Chris Epps Porzingis and moved a bunch of bad contracts off to bring in one pretty still bad contract. Um, that could be a team that's looking to appease Bradley Beal and, and, you know, and maybe willing to trade for Jeremy Grant. And then you could arm the Pistons with more picks, um, you know, more essentially shots, you know, land a, a multiple um, potentially linchpin type players. So, yeah, that's something that we're going to talk about later. And I'm sure we'll have some written content about it, too, about the Pistons options. Um, with a Jeremy Grant trade. So let's go through just the first couple of picks here and talk about who we think is going to be selected. Orlando goes one. They get the first pick. They're going to get one of Paolo, Chet Holm, Glenn Jabari Smith on a team that is already laden with fours and fives. Um, so as a little ancillary topic off of that, the Pistons are in the market for a center. We've talked about DeAndre Ayton as a, a uh, real possibility uh, for Detroit. Um, what do you think the odds are that uh, they go after Deion Rayton? Does that seem like a, you know, a pretty likely scenario? I think it makes all the sense in the world for the Pistons um, to go after Deion Drayton. And actually our great sponsor bet online um, posted odds today on, uh, teams that you know are projected to land DeAndre and if he ends up uh, leaving Phoenix and Detroit was uh, you know the number one team at plus 100 uh, to get DeAndre and so they were the top uh, you know they they have the the, uh, the highest odds of landing uh, DeAndre and if he leaves Phoenix uh, via free agency I think he'd be an absolutely great fit for Detroit um, so a player to I lead the defense uh, a guy that would uh -huh. work well in the pick and roll and has, you know, that little inside out game, um, you know, with the mid range um, to make him a really interesting fit offensively. Um, he's shooting the three a little bit, didn't do it a ton, um, but I think we saw it a little bit more towards the end of the year. I think it's something he can do, um, but even just his ability to hit 16, you know, 16, 18 foot jumpers, um, you know, that's a, a nice thing as well. I think he'd be a great fit. He's very young, um, but, you know, you have to weigh the, the opposite side of it, which is, hey, are you willing to pay this guy max money? Are you willing to pay a center? Uh, right. He's been obviously a top, you know, center in the league or a top name in the league, like a, a Jokic or Embiid, who's obviously MVP level. Are you willing to pay that to someone like Aiton? But uh, I think Detroit has the cap space. He's young. He should get better. Uh, we've seen him flourish in Phoenix. Uh, he's going to be playing with good ball handlers and, and distributors in Detroit with someone like uh, Gabe Cunningham, potentially Jaden Ivey. So I, I think it makes all the sense in the world to be absolutely locked in on DeAndre Ayton if possible. So what I was getting you to go into was um, the market for center. And, and you, you brought up the point that I wanted you to bring up, which was do you want to pay top dollar for a center that had a very mysterious fourth quarter really game seven against the Dallas Mavericks. He played 17 minutes, um, kind of weird. Um, and Monty Williams, head coach for the Suns, Monty Williams was very cryptic about why that was the case. Um, so let's just say that the Pistons are a, not able to get DeAndre Ayton or decide, yeah, we're going to use our dollars elsewhere. With the Orlando Magic getting the top pick, going after somebody like Mo Bamba, which we mentioned at the trade deadline as a low cost center, younger center to build around. I think the Pistons could potentially benefit from Orlando once again in the market for a center for a Chet Holmgren type player. Chet Jabari, um, Paolo is a big, not a center, but he's a big. Um, so who do you think the Magic are going to take at one? Oh, man, I so – and this is what I thought, you know, leading up to the lottery and from the scouting that I've done so far, and not that, you know, I was done or anything, uh, but I really like Paolo Bencaro. He's the guy that as of now is my number one prospect uh, in this draft class. I think any of the top teams, specifically um, a team like Orlando or like Oklahoma City, who really uh, need might still need the guy offensively, um, at least, you know, for Orlando, they need the guy. And Oklahoma City has Shea Gilgis-Alexander, but they could use another piece. 
uh, that could really be a focal point of the offense. And I think Paolo Bencaro is that uh, he's very comfortable handling the basketball for a 6'10 forward. Uh, he's got good passing ability. He is comfortable attacking the basket, posting up. Uh, didn't shoot great from beyond the arc in college, but it just feels like that's something that he will get better at. Um, looking at his shot profile, looking at uh, his comfort shooting the basketball from really anywhere on the court. Uh, he's the guy offensively in this draft class that is most talented. Uh, his feel for the game, he's plays composed. I really like him on that side of the floor. And just from the scouting that I've done, I thought his defensive shortcomings uh, had been over-exaggerated. I mean, the games that I've watched certainly am not seeing the, you know, defensive shortcomings that were really, really highlighted from what I had seen on social media uh, of people talking about how poorly he plays on that side of the floor. I mean, there are plays here and there that he misses, um, but I also saw plays where he was engaged on the other side of the floor. You know, he was helped use his strength to hold his own in post battles, uh, moves his feet, crashes the glass. So I think Paolo would be a great choice for Orlando uh, at one, but I think, you, I think they're going to be looking at all three of these guys. Like the, the chance on Chet Holmgren is he could be the best two way player of this class. Uh, he has certainly the most interesting archetype. I think there's a lot of concern around, will his body be able to handle the NBA competition, the NBA size, but I think highest ceiling Chet Holmgren is the guy. Um, so Orlando has to weigh, are they looking for maybe, a guy that doesn't have the absolute highest ceiling, but has a higher floor like Paolo, or are they going to risk it for a guy like Chet? Uh, Jabari Smith Jr., the guy lights out shooter, very athletic, feels like he's going to be a uh, pretty useful on both ends of the floor. He can be a high level role player, even if he doesn't hit his peak. Um, if I'm Orlando, I would take Paolo. I, if I was Detroit, I would have taken Paolo. If I was Oklahoma City, I would have taken Paolo. Paolo, I think, is the guy. Um, but I could certainly see them taking Chet. And I think uh, 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 with Chet, Franz Wagner, and uh, Wendell Carter Jr. in the front court, Orlando's got some really, really good pieces. And then they've got a group of guards, Cole Anthony, um, Markel Fultz, uh, Jalen Suggs. Like they've got some different guys that they still have to figure out which uh, of those guards fits and might be the most talented moving forward. But if you can lock in your front court with Chet, um, Wendell Carter and Franz Wagner. I think there's a lot of talent there, a lot of defensive versatility there that Orlando uh, from the get-go would be really building a defensive juggernaut. So uh, I, I think in the end it might be Chet, but if it were me picking, I would take Paolo. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I think it's one of those two. I, I do lean Chet a little bit more, I think. Um, because of what you had mentioned, that that, that good two-way versatility that, that he has. And there's been some comments about how, how thin he is. I don't think that has stopped – that has not stopped a team from not drafting a player. I mean, there were very similar sentiments about Evan Mobley weighing not enough to be a four or a five in the league. It doesn't matter. Chet is a very versatile player with um, the ability to guard on the perimeter. He's an – excellent rim protector i think it makes a lot of sense for orlando and i mean we could probably speed the first three up the first three picks are pretty much set in stone agreed in some in some order yeah i agree i, I mean i don't think i don't see why any of the top three wouldn't take uh whichever they can get of chet jabari and paulo and we agree that they're probably not going to be trading out of those spots I would agree. Yeah. I don't think any of the top three are going to be looking. I mean, they're all at the earlier stages of a rebuild, um, especially teams like Houston and Orlando uh, and Oklahoma city. They're all really at the beginning stages. Uh, I mean, I think Orlando, or excuse me, Oklahoma city has the best player out of those three with Shea. So maybe they're the team that could potentially take the jump next between Shea, Josh Giddy, and whoever they get, um, you know, with this top pick, but Still, they're all pieces away from getting out of the sure. bottom of their conference. So let's go to pick number four then, which is a team that would love to make the play-in tournament. 
um, if not the playoffs, and that's the Sacramento Kings. Sacramento at four. Let's assume that Paolo is gone, Jabari Smith is gone, and Chet Holmgren. They're all gone. Um, if you're the Sacramento Kings and you're quirky <laughs> and you just traded for Demonis Sabonis plus a whole bunch of other depth bench pieces, including Pistons legend Trey Lyles, <laughs> um, who would you be taking at four if you're the Sacramento Kings? Are you going to go with Jade Nivey? Are you going to look to move that pick? Um, what's the yeah. what's the, are, are you going for someone that is more seasoned like a Keegan Murray? Yeah, see, Sacramento, it, it's tough for me to ever try to think like the Sacramento Kings because I would never want to think like the Sacramento Kings. You don't. Um, I don't really know what they should do it for. I think if I were them, I'd be looking to trade out of the spot, uh, which could end up hurting the Pistons because a team might jump before that wants Jaden Ivey, um, which I guess is why, you know, earlier I said, I don't know if it really matters for Detroit to try to move up to four, but if there's another team that's going to do it, then maybe that kind of forces Detroit's hand to do so. Uh, but if I'm Sacramento at four, I think I'm looking to trade out. If I end up having to pick someone, um, man, that's tough. I don't see why uh, they take a guard. I don't. Go ahead. I just yeah, don't and no, I totally guard. agree. Unless they think, yeah, let's actually go ahead and trade Aaron Fox. But to me, it seems like they decided between him and Tyrese Halliburton at, at, at the deadline. That's what they picked. Right. They went and got Sabonis for Tyrese Halliburton. So I don't feel like they're moving the Aaron Fox. And I don't feel like they're moving Davion Mitchell. So if they do get Jaden Ivey and – most mock drafts I've seen have Jay Nivey going, going four, um, which is fine. I mean, I think the Kings need to take probably either need to take best player available. They can't get cute or they just need to trade out of that spot. Um, I think Ivy would, you know, he's, he's got a question regarding his ability to, you know, handle point guard duties. Um, he, he'd be probably more of an off ball guy and maybe that works. Maybe that fits fine in Sacramento. His shooting is still a bit of a question mark. He made a bit of a jump last year for Purdue, um, but super athletic and elite speed. And that paired with Darren Fox, who's one of the fastest players in the league is probably tantalizing enough that they do take Jaden Ivey. What teams, like, should the Pistons be engaged on trying to trade to move up one spot? Do you, do you think that that, I mean, how, what, what are you willing to move to move up one spot to get right. Jaden Ivey? Yeah, exactly. Like, does that cost them Jeremy Grant? And if it does. Uh, no way. It doesn't really make sense to give up five and Jeremy Grant. Like, if you can't get Jaden Ivey then I think, you know, if I'm making the decision right now, I'm on the clock, Jaden Ivey's off the board, I'm taking Shaden Sharp. And it's a high-risk type pick because we haven't seen him since July of 2021, uh, but he was the number one kid in his class for a reason. He is athletic. He's got a great NBA-type body. He's strong, good build. There are reasons why he is, after having not played a competitive basketball game since – Again, July of 2021, that a year later, he's being talked about as a top four or five pick in this draft. I mean, he was projected for in the ESPN um, post lottery mock draft. So in that scenario, Ivy would be on the board. But if you cannot get him, I don't think I'd be willing to give up Jeremy Grant and number five to move up one spot. I think I'd at that point just be comfortable taking Sharp and it's high risk, but uh, he probably has a rather high ceiling compared uh, to some of the other guys like a Keegan Murray or an AJ Griffin. Um, I would be comfortable taking sharp rather than trading Jeremy Grant at that point. Um, but I don't really know what else, like what does a team look for when it's really about moving up one spot? Like what do they give up? Is it a future pick? I guess that's really the only other thing that makes sense. Um, unless Detroit, you know, would attach something like Isaiah Stewart. Um, and still, does that make a lot of sense? Or are you giving up too much at that point to move up one single spot? 
I think it's too much. It'd be different if you're going from four to three. Sure. But yes. You're going that's also fair. Four. That's also fair. The talent jump between three and four is is legitimate. So I think that's right. Also- and you know, we're kind of poo pooing on Jaden Ivy a little bit. He's a very good player. Um, no, I like Jaden Ivy a lot. I talked about it yeah. for months that he's a guy that's kind of risen. I, my opinion of him has risen over the last few months. Um, and I mean, I, it, that is like the guy that as of now, I think would be best for Detroit at five. I think if they, if they're lucky enough that the Kings don't take him at four, that would be great for the Pistons. He is very, very explosive. Uh, he got a little bit better as a shooter. I know he, you know, his shooting really was only good for a, a month or two. And then it kind of wasn't great. Um, but he is an explosive athlete. He grew as a player. He reminds you of these guards that are really starting to dominate the game right now. The John Morant, uh, he has, you know, that speed, like uh, Darius Garland that you've seen uh, in Cleveland. These quicker guards that can get to the lane. Obviously, the shooting is something that uh, is going to have to get better with him. Uh, you know, the ball handling as a guard is something that's going to have to get better. But there's a lot of raw talent there that uh, Detroit would be very lucky to get him at five. I, I, not to take away yep. from what he is at all. I mean, you wanted a top three pick. It, it, it's not good for Detroit that they ended up at five, but uh, they would still be lucky at this point to get their hands on, on Ivy. Yep, absolutely. So that brings us to five. And I'll just go through a couple of mocks of what teams have. The SB Nation's mock has the Pistons taking Adrian Griffin at five. Shaden Sharp is going six to the Indiana Pacers. Um, what do you think about Adrian Griffin? AJ Griffin is a guy that, you know, I've, as I've been scouting Paulo, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of him and uh, Mark Williams and Keels. Um, I, I don't think I would take him at five. I think at that point I would take, you know, Ivy Sharp. Uh, I'd probably take Keegan Murray over him. Uh, ben Matherin from Arizona. Um, AJ Griffin. I know that he was able to pick up a bigger role as the season went on at Duke, um, but I, I don't feel like I saw enough from him uh, to justify taking him over some of these guys that we've seen play basketball for two years now at the collegiate level. Ivy Matherin Murray. Um, and then I just think like Shaden Sharp, obviously that I mentioned has the higher ceiling out of probably that group of guys. Um, so I would be willing to take the risk on him. I don't think AJ Griffin has that. I think AJ Griffin's, you know, peak is a, a solid role player, but I don't know what he does. That is necessarily great. Like he does a handful of things. Good. Like he was a, a, a good three point shooter um, at Duke, but there's questions about the the shot form being realistic at at the NBA, is it gonna you know continue to? Is he gonna be able to continue to shoot uh, the ball that well? Um, he's got good size, but wasn't a great defender. He was, you know, average to good, but definitely wasn't like oh my gosh, this is one of the you know the best defenders in, in the game right now. Um, I think he's probably more of an eight to ten kind of guy. Uh, I think you know those guys that we've already mentioned are who you'd be looking at at five. Um, Everyone else to me is kind of a tier below. Uh, maybe Ben Matherin's the other guy that I would include with Ivy Sharp and Murray. So Shaden Sharp is the wild card here. Much like the Sacramento Kings, Shaden Sharp is the wild card. He's got a legitimate opportunity, I think, to go four. I think the Kings could definitely take Shaden Sharp four. And a few of the mocks I've seen have a similar um sentiment about that he is very talented um would you would you rather have sharp or ivy shane sharp is 19 i think i would take ivy i think i would take ivy um i just like the progression that i saw from ivy you know not only like from the year one to year two jump but from the beginning of year two to the end of year two jump just to be able to see that growth, you know, I have to trust that more than not having seen a kid play at, at the college level or overseas at all, not having film on him uh, from the past, you know, essentially two years. Uh, I have to trust what I've seen from a, 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 another prospect that 
we've seen take legitimate steps in his game. You can see the fit alongside Kate Cunningham in the backcourt. Uh, I would be taking Jaden Ivey at five if he's available uh, for the Detroit Pistons, assuming the expected top three in whichever order of Chet, Paolo, and Jabari are off the board. Jaden Ivey is the next guy on that on that big board for me, uh, and he would be the guy that I would take if I were the Pistons. I have to trust the progression. Uh, I have to trust that his, his jump shot will continue to grow. He'll find consistency with it. Um, but the things that he does right now, the explosiveness, the ability to get to the cup, uh, the ability to finish with elite athleticism at the rim. Uh, there are legitimate things that I see in his game that would bring a something to Detroit that they really don't have. They don't have uh, that explosive playmaker right now. And Ivy would certainly bring that from day one uh, with his speed and athleticism. Yeah, I, I think I'm in the same boat. Sharp is an unknown. I think that unknown, is, it goes both ways. You know, he is a top of the class type of player who could, you know, turn out to be something really special. Um, we just haven't seen him play in such a long time. We've seen Jaden Ivey play on the big stage of March Madness, which I know is not an indicator of uh, how, you know, how, how good a player translates or else all of the St. Peter's players would at least have been considered. Um, but, you know, we saw him do some things in the tournament. We saw him do some things in the Big Ten tournament. He is a very acrobatic finisher around the rim. Um, in a similar way, it kind of reminds me uh, of Jalen Green, who can kind of contort his body around the rim. He does an excellent job of maintaining body control, finishing uh, around the rim, and providing rim pressure. And, you know, the Pistons need that future piece to pair alongside Kate Cunningham. And let's be clear, almost everybody – works alongside Kate Cunningham. The Pistons should not be looking for who fits. Everybody will fit uh, with Kate Cunningham. If you draft another guard, and I don't want this to turn into a Killing Hayes discussion, but let's say that they do take one of those two. They take Shade Sharp or Jay Ivey. Does that impact the future for Killian Hayes at all? Well, I think if you take Jaden Ivey, you're taking him to start alongside Kate Cunningham. I think if you take someone like Sharp, who hasn't played at a high enough level, you know, that's a guy that ends up starting the season coming off the bench. Um, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe he ends up starting the season in the G League or something uh, to try to get, you know, that competition level up and adjust him to that. I mean, the jump from high school to, to NBA is it's massive. And we haven't seen it done since LeBron James. So, um, I think if you draft Ivy, you know, you're, you're, you're drafting him to pair not only in the future, but right now alongside Kate Cunningham sharp. It's a little bit murkier. Uh, I think what we saw from Killian Hayes when he was coming off the bench is probably uh, what will be best for him moving forward. I think it allowed him to do a little bit more and he played a lot more comfortable in that role. Um, you know, maybe, year three is different and he'll feel more comfortable and he'll have made you know, the adjustments necessary in his game between the three point shooting, uh, you know, being able to play alongside Kate a little bit better and fit in with other guys that are commanding the ball and Jeremy Grant and Sadiq Bay. Uh, but we did see him play his best basketball coming off the bench. And while that coincides with it being, you know, as he got, you know, deeper into the, the second part of his second season. And when you look at his games played, he, you know, really has only played, just over 80 games. So he's really only played one season's worth of basketball between his first two years in the league. Um, but I think if you get a guy like Jaden Ivey, that's a guy that you're looking to pair long-term uh, alongside Kate Cunningham. And it's unfortunate uh, for Killian Hayes because I, I, obviously I was incredibly high on Hayes uh, when he was a draft prospect, but we have not seen enough from him to dictate Detroit's decision-making in the draft. They have to draft, uh, you know, the best prospect available, whether that impacts Hayes' future alongside Cunningham in the starting lineup or not. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree. If you take Jaden Ivey, you're putting him next to Kate Cunningham and letting, letting a very young backcourt do its thing, which has its own 
bumps and bruises along the way and having two two um, young guys essentially lead the offense from 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 that point of view um you know in thinking more about this and i guess this will be one of my last few questions for you here in thinking about this and i talked about shade sharp being a wild card and i think the king could take shade sharp i'm more i think that they could do that i th I, I think in looking at fox and ivy I think those are more duplicative players that have overlapping skill sets. And Shaden Sharp is a little bit taller. Um, looks like he can complement more of what is already on Sacramento's roster. I, I also think it's just as likely the Kings say, you know, let's just trade back. Try to scoop a quality player off of uh, a team that couldn't make it into the top four and move back and just call it a day. But in, in thinking about this, I, I think that the Kings are not going to take Jaden Ivey because of that sort of skill overlap. And this is the pivot point for the draft. Um, so I just want to get that in. I, I think that the, the Pistons will have a good chance at getting Jaden Ivey, assuming that Sacramento stays. Because I think that they're they're are just they don't have the margin for error if they are trying to make the playoffs next year or at least make the play in. They don't have the margin for error to take another very young uh player like like Ivy or Shane Sharp. And they could just move back. And if they're willing to take a player in that spot, then um I I I think it would be Shane Sharp. Or they can go right off the wall and take Keegan Murray, like we all think that they're capable of doing, um, and just just going with somebody that nobody thought. But I am going to talk myself into Sacramento not taking Jay Nivey to make this easier for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aaron, any last thoughts on the lottery? We saw the Cavs at fourteen; they were pretty much earmarked for that from the very beginning. New Orleans gets eight. Um, the Athletic has said that. Their guess is that the Pelicans keep that pick and attempt to strengthen their bench, um, and they can keep it on. They can keep that player at a, you know, a relatively cheap price. So that was another team I thought could be interested in moving for you know trading their pick for Jeremy Grant because they are another team that is certainly looking for um, ways to move into the playoff picture. Uh, well, deeper because they gave the fraudulent sons a run for their money. Um, any other thoughts, you know, we, we didn't really talk about Portland at seven, Portland was a team that was very much in on Jeremy Grant, you know, any, any other thoughts from the lottery? Well, I do think Portland's going to be another one of those teams, uh, that is very much open to moving their pick. Obviously they're going to want to improve their roster right away, uh, with David. That's going to happen. Um, so they're going to be, I would imagine they'll be very aggressive in trying to, to trade either up in the draft to get a bigger name or trade the pick to get uh, an NBA player right now. Um, going back to Detroit. If they're picking I, seven. Dame has been traded. Yeah, right. I just can't see it. I can't see it. I mean, and maybe it comes to draft day where they're ending up picking at seven, but still trading the player. Um, but I, I, I just can't see them keeping – seven at this point i mean they're it's not happening they moved up and you know had a chance at one of the top guys obviously they're much more inclined to keep it um, but i think they actually like dropped a spot i think they were six and they dropped to seven they um, did they they finished the year two and 21 and are ending up at seven brutal brutal um but yeah, there's no way that they are making that pick no way one final point that I wanted to make, um, going back to Jeremy Grant, because I mentioned it uh, earlier in the show, I think that this ends up making the situation uh, for Detroit a little bit easier uh, in terms of keeping him. If you're drafting a Chet, a Apollo, or a Jabari Smith, you're essentially, in theory, drafting his replacement at the four spot. Um unless you're sliding Sadiq Bay down to the two or bringing Sadiq Bay off the bench, which I think would be unlikely um, given how he's performed and you know, 
how he's kind of slots in right now is one of the key pieces of the the core moving forward, uh, whether you believe in him that much or not. Uh, but you would essentially be drafting Jeremy Grant's uh, replacement. And if you still had him on the roster and Sadiq Bey, it you know, be difficult to, to start any of the top three guys, which obviously you, you pretty much have to do because of the talent that they have. Um, so right. being at five, looking at an Ivy or a Sharp or a Ben Matherin, those are guards. Uh, even if you took Keegan Murray, uh, it's easier to keep Jeremy Grant because he's, you know, he's not being threatened for that starting spot. Now there's not another forward coming in that, uh, you know, would deserve or, or for his upside, you know, deserve or need to be playing the starting four spot. Um, he remains a vital part of this team, whether uh, you want to, to pay his next contract or not currently as standing, he is a big part of this team because he's the second most talented player on the current roster outside of Kate Cunningham. Um, so it definitely, you know, makes it easier to build with him moving forward. Obviously he's eligible for a four year, $112 million contract extension this off season. Um, and this doesn't mean that the Pistons won't trade him this summer. They still could, but I think now that, you know, you don't necessarily have to draft his uh, essential, essentially replacement at one, two or three, and you can draft a guard. There's still a spot for him in that starting lineup. Um, and you could, go into next season feeling comfortable with him at the four spot. Um, obviously that doesn't lock it in, but I think it's easier now than had they got one, two or three, because it just be like, there's something looming there. Someone's going to get screwed, whether it's Grant or Bay. Um, that's really not going to happen. Now, even if they took Keegan Murray, you know, they could bring him off the bench or whatever um, because he's not of that same, you know, and he's not in that same tier of, of the top three. Um, so I think it, it, it gets easier to keep Jeremy Grant, but heck they, they could trade him. Uh, something that I've been thinking about is, you know, and I don't know if this works financially or anything, but is this what, you know, is he the guy that gets moved in a Deandre and trade? Like does Phoenix still want to upgrade and can they do it financially? And is, you know, does it work in the CBA to essentially swap Aiton for, for Grant? Um, or, you know, does more money have to be attached there? I'm not exactly sure, but I feel like that could uh, potentially be a possibility as well. If Phoenix doesn't just want to let him walk and wants to try to recoup assets from him uh, if they're not able to keep him. Uh, but as of now, I think Jeremy Grant's future becomes a little bit safer in Detroit. Not that it's necessarily still safe, but it's safer. Well, one thing that's for sure is that we're in for an interesting couple of weeks here. Before no, no doubt. the draft, we are in. Yes, we are in for an interesting couple of weeks here. A lot can change. I mean, and guys rise up and fall down these draft boards. I mean, every everything that we said today, it has like a ninety five percent chance of being at least sixty percent wrong. wrong. Oh, all <laughs> of it's going to be wrong. Who, who are we kidding? The Pistons are going to yeah. end up with like <laughs> Jalen Duran. And we're just going to be like looking back at this, um, you know, a month from now and like, well, we're just really, we're just really dumb people. So right. none of this is going to happen. Heck we, it's yeah. There's just no way what we said here today, a month, uh, a month, a little bit over a month away from the draft is going to stand true uh, come June 23rd. Right. But we hope that you'll still be tuned in for all of our editions of the Palace Pistons podcast leading up to the NBA draft on June 23rd. We'll have plenty of written content um, coming to palaceofpistons.com as we look to um, gear up for a very important day for the Pistons. We talked about, and we're going to talk about this later, but um, down the line, th this is a big um, sort of a turning point for Detroit. They are at, at, at a, point in their rebuild where if they're back in the top three again next year um, there are some major fundamental problems um, and the team is probably going to be at a bit of a crossroads so this is an important summer they they want to set the foundation right um, to get back into the playoffs so we hope that you'll all join us um, as we gear up to talk about the NBA draft coming on June 23rd so that is going to do it for this edition of Palace of Pistons podcast, a rapid fire reaction pod from the NBA lottery. 
the NBA draft lottery. The Pistons will pick fifth overall. Um, and we can't wait to see whatever happens. This is the NBA. Crazy things happen constantly. And uh, we hope that you'll be tuned in with us along. So for my co-host Aaron Johnson and for poor Jasper, who was unable, unable uh, to make it, I am Mike Angolano. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Palace of Twisted Podcast, part of the Believe Podcast Network. We'll see you all next time.